to um, the 2021 Menhaden Advisory Committee, first meeting of the year. Hope everybody had, since we last met, had a, an enjoyable holiday and it's been safe and, and um, healthy. Spring's here, weather's warming, so hopefully the outlook for 21 coming forward will be uh, more positive than 2020, that's for sure. Um, I don't know if we will have the opportunity to meet in person. I guess that remains to be seen later this year. So since we are all remote, um, why don't we go ahead and just run through introductions really quickly. It just helps me to keep track of who's here and, and in terms of an organizational um, perspective. So I'll just call names. And if I call your name, just kind of chime in, uh, unmute, chime in, introduce yourself and, and note your affiliation. Um, I'm just going to go in alpha order. So first on the list is Steve Atkinson. Yeah, hi, Rob. This is Steve. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you well. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Thanks. Yeah, I, and I'm, the recreation, I'm the recreational rep, angler rep. Yep. Yep, perfect. Uh, Monty, uh, are Monty. you there? Hi, Rob. Hi, Rob. I am here. I'm the uh, industry rep. Great. Thanks, Monty. Um, AJ. Chairman AJ is here representing. Sorry, AJ is here, Rob, representing First Name Bait. Great, thanks, AJ. Uh, no, no, no word on Mark. I take it still. So we'll go to Daniel Knott. Yeah, Dan Knott, and I'm with the. Uh, I'm a commercial uh, fisherman. Great, thanks, Daniel. Uh, Mike Leonard. Hey, Rob. Uh, Mike Leonard. Uh, with American Sport Fishing Association representing the recreational fishing industry. Thanks, Mike. Shanna? Shanna Madsen, I work for VMRC and I am your technical committee representative. And our vice chair, thank you very much. Chris Moore? <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Chris Moore, uh, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, and I represent uh, conservation interest. And Ken Schultz? Yep. Hi, this is Ken, and I'm uh, an at-large member coming from the Eastern Shore. Great. Thanks, Ken. Thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Rob Latour. I'm the chair, thankfully, um, and I'm a professor of fishery science at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. I've been involved in Menhaden science and management for going on 16 years now, so it's been a long haul. Um, I wanted to take a second to remind everybody of our role. Um, we're an advisory committee to the VMRC. VMRC now has, or recently acquired about a year ago, management authority over Menhaden and Virginia Waters. And this committee was formed as part of the process to transfer uh, management authority to the commission. And our job is to advise the commission on any matters that need to be raised regarding management moving forward. Um, I'd like to sort of try to ensure that our deliberations have, um, uh, you know, a positive discourse to them. So to the degree possible, I'd ask for everyone to be, um, you know, kind and respective of each other's opinions, even if you disagree. Disagreeing is fine, um, but a, a positive discourse would be most desirable. And also, I'd like for our deliberations to be centered on, to the degree possible, evidence-based information. Um, obviously, there may be things that we discuss that don't have a lot of information available. Or, or, I don't know. Did, am I gone? No, if you're there, Steve, it's, it looks Anybody like you're not on? on mute. You might want to mute yourself. We're getting a little bit of feedback from you. Thanks, Shanna. Um, Last thing I wanted to say, just op you know, opening remarks was just um, some of the things we talk about may or may not have a lot of information associated with them, so we may have to rely on anecdotal or observational information, and and that's fine. But to the degree that things um, work through the process to the point where we may want to actually formally recommend something to the commission, I'd, I'd like to try to make it as evidence-based and as well thought out and comprehensively thought out as possible. Um, those are just my sort of um, kind of guidelines for for running the meetings and running the committee. I'm welcome to you know hearing other people's input and taking the, that input, but 
think to be most effective for the commission, um, you know, so an approach similar to what I just outlined would be um, ideal. So with that, uh, I think we'll move to item two on the agenda. Has everyone had, or has anyone not had, or not received the November 20 meeting, November 2020 meeting minutes? Silence would be ind indicative of you've received those minutes. Can anybody hear me? Is that you, Monty? Are we still connected? I hear you fine, Rob. Yeah. I'm not having any problems. Okay. I'm not I'm um, not sure who that was. I'm sorry. Okay. No problem. Um assuming everyone's reviewed the minutes, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Seconded. Thanks. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Maybe it's better to say anyone opposed to approving the minutes from our last meeting? Okay. Hearing none, minutes have been approved. Thanks very much, Shanna. Are, are you going to transfer presenter authority to me, or do you want me to email you my slides real quick? I trust you, Rob. So we're gonna we're gonna let you steer this one. <laughs> okay. So I'm now presenter. Do you see me? I do see you as presenter. So you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen that that little share button is now an actual button instead of being grayed out. And then from oh, yeah. there, you should be able to select which screen you want to share. Yeah. So note to self: don't have many screens open, huh? Right. <laughs> okay. How about now? You see these this opening slide? We do. I think once you make it bigger, we should be good to go. Okay, great. Um, so in putting together the agenda, um, one of the ideas that Shanna and I had and, and VMRC staff is um, the notion that it might be valuable to work through some of the basic underlying biology of Menhaden, its life history, some of the fisheries data that are routinely collected and analyzed in the context of the traditional stock assessment. Um, this is mostly born from the idea that we don't know how much background other committee members have and to try to help level the playing field so that we're operating from um, the same level of information. I've got a few slides here that I'm going to work through um, just to kind of give everyone a flavor of the types of information that are typically um, discussed at technical level meetings that lead into the ultimate um, information presented to the management board at ASMFC. Um, and really all I'm gonna do is just try to list in sort of a semi-sequential order um, characteristics of the stock that we know or have been well-defined in the scientific literature. Um, so the first one here is simply kind of fishery science 101 when we talk about understanding impacts of harvest and other things, we have to first understand what's our unit of operation, and that's what's defined as a stock, a fish stock. Um, and for Menhaden, the stock structure has historically been thought of to be a single stock that occupies a range of habitats along the East Coast, ranging from northern Florida all the way up into the Gulf of Maine in some cases in some years. Um, this was based on historic data from the 1970s looking at size information, and in, and in just an enormous tagging study that was conducted in the 60s. I'll describe that a little bit more in a few minutes. Um, more recently, though, there's been some genetic work done that has shown little to no genetic variation among fish collected from various locations in New England compared to Mid-Atlantic and Chesapeake Bay and even South Atlantic. Um, so the genetic studies have all concluded a single population along the East Coast, and, and this is relevant because obviously we're focused on Menhaden in Virginia, um, but the lack of any structure implies that we have to be mindful of the things that we talk about and discuss because this really is a coastwide population. You might compare that to striped bass where it would be appropriate here 
to say we have Chesapeake Bay striped bass or Delaware Bay striped bass or Hudson River striped bass because there is stock structure within the coastwide population. So the management unit is the coastwide Menhaden population and there's not really a legitimate concept for Chesapeake Bay Menhaden, although of course every year we have some portion of the Menhaden population that utilizes the Chesapeake Bay. Um, seasonal movements, and this is the tagging study I mentioned, it's probably the largest that I'm aware of ever conducted. Over a million fish were tagged in, in the 1960s using electromagnetic um, tags where tags were implanted in fish and then at the various reduction plants along the coast there were, were scanners or, or magnets that would detect whether or not a fish had a tag in it or not. Um, and these magnets were uh, in 17 of the reduction plants back in the day when there were plants uh, distributed along the coast. And that information told us that adults move inshore and north during, during spring. They tended to overwinter in the Carolinas and when spring would come, movements would go north and inshore. Older fish would, would migrate farther north. Younger fish would stay more in the mid-Atlantic area. And then that process would kind of reverse itself during uh, fall when and, and leading into winter. So we have this kind of conglomerate Menhaden population moving up and down the coast and some portions of it, which remain largely unknown, um, enter into estuarine or near coastal areas. Uh, more recently, a student at, at University of Maryland reanalyzed those tagging data for the purpose of providing more contemporary analytical methods. In the 70s, we didn't have as much um, analytical development as we do now. And so it was to get a better handle on whether that idea of the movement patterns were really true. And, and the results of that study um, indicated that, yeah, in large part, that general pattern of north in the spring movement, south in the, in the fall held true. But the, the big nugget that came out of this analysis was that there seemed to be appreciable portion of the stock that would stay north or that didn't migrate south in the cooler months of the year. In fact, Roughly 55% of the fish in the north um, migrated south, leaving 45% distributed in those more northerly areas. So there's a newer understanding that fish are more stratified along the coast throughout the entire year. Growth is variable through time um, and largely tied to environmental conditions and density dependence. And density dependence is really just referring to the amount of Menhaden in the ecosystem. So under conditions of high Menhaden abundance, growth tends to be slower than when uh, there are fewer Menhaden in the environment. And so the figure on the lower left um, just tracks the average weight of a 200 millimeter fish in Chesapeake Bay through time from 1955 to 2017, which was the time period of the most recent assessment. And the black solid line there shows the variable average weight through time. It's not giving what appears to be a strong trend in, in any one particular direction, but it just illustrates that growth can be quite variable in Menhaden from year to year. And for the purposes of the assessment, that yellow line, which is the average, was used in the modeling moving forward. The other two figures are more of an age related to length or length at age. Um, characterization, and, and this is for age, an age two fish through time over the same years. The top plot shows the, the variation in the average estimated maximum size of Menhaden, um, of an age two Menhaden, and you can see that there's quite a bit of variability depending on which period of, of time we're looking at. Um, and, and to my eye, there's a slight declining trend in the average maximum size of age two over the last, say, 20 years or so. And then the bottom panel just shows another growth parameter um, that's not independent or unrelated to the max size. It's the rate at which animals achieve their max size. So if max size is going down, then the rate that the animals get there goes up. So that, that's sort of a, a, a predictable relationship. But the point here is to illustrate the notion that growth is very different. So when we think about metrics of the population like biomass, biomass is obviously heavily tied to weight. Um, weight is variable, and these, these processes seem to be driven by environmental process um, as well as abundance uh, of menhaden in the water. Um, we learned a little bit about larval menhaden over the last few years. Um, data from NOAA has indicated that 
Um, larval abundance, which is the lower plot on the left, has been increasing at least from about early 2000s through 2013 as compared to in the 1970s. So there's more larval menhaden in the water, but conversely, the, the survival of those larvae has seemingly decreased in recent times. So there's a negative effect there, which is the plot on the right. So while we have an increase in larval, larval abundance over the last day, decade, the pre-recruit survival has decreased. And um, the authors of this work have attributed that to increased temperatures in estuarine and coastal areas, as well as other habitat-related um, phenomena. Maturity is tied to size rather than age. So maturity here just refers to the the size at which animals can become reproductively active, and that's been quite variable over time and across year classes. So each line in the plot represents an age, where the, the line represents the probability or proportion of that age class that can become sexually um, mature or reproductively active. And you can see a lot of variation, not much um, contributions to reproduction from age one fish, certainly more for two, age two, age three, age four. Um, but there's quite a bit of variation in the proportion of those age classes that are actually contributing to uh, future generations, depending on the time period of the uh, of the analysis. So again, this is important to know that it's tied to size, tied to growth. Growth is mediated by environmental things, density dependence, other factors. Uh, reproduction, historically, from this work in the 70s, men and were classified as what's called determinant total spawners. This would be a fish that develops a certain total number of eggs that it's going to release. A female fish would release in a spawning season. And that total is you know, just expelled over a short period of time. Um, we've re here at VIMS, we've reevaluated this um, and collected new animals and processed them for different um, assessments of spawning mode and actually determined that that, that determinant total spawner characterization is not correct. The menhaden fit more of an indeterminate batch spawning species, which would suggest that a female would generate many batches of eggs throughout the year and release those batches of eggs in periodic fashion. Um, the question becomes, how long is the spawning season? Um, we didn't have the best sample size, but we estimated at a low end a minimum of at least 90 days. It's, it's more than likely much longer than that. And so when you compare total numbers of eggs produced under the old historic uh, dogma versus what we've discovered more recently, there's been quite a vast change in the perceived reproductive output of females, these animals. And it fits their life history. They're, they're just remarkably reproductively fecund. Um, natural mortality is the concept we refer to as all sources of mortality other than fishing. Um, and this plot just illustrates that Number one, natural mortality is believed to be high. There are a number of different uh, approaches that are used to estimate natural mortality, and those are all depicted on the curves um, on the plot. An M of over one, or an M of about 1.15, is um, translates to a, a probability of survival of 31%, or a proportional survival of 0.31, suggesting that in, an, in a year, only 31% of the cohort or the group of animals you're referring to would survive natural causes. The reason I bring this up is simply that um, for most stock assessments, M is believed to be anywhere from 0.2 to 0.4. So men Hayden are very different in that respect and that the stock assessment method has captured the believed um, high M's, which obviously would tie to its role as a forage fish um, at, at the mid-trophic level of the ecosystem. So, to some to some degree, you know, the, the assessment has captured um, the high pressure of natural mortality that men need to experience. A little bit about the fisheries data, and I'll wrap up and hand it over to Shanna. There is some low level of recreational information available. Um, suggesting that there are recreational landings on the order of maybe 500 metric tons a year. Um, these data are probably not all that reflective of reality. There's high degrees of uncertainty in these data, um, but nevertheless, they were incorporated into the assessment. Oops. 
Um, commercial landings, as we all know, are divided into the reduction, um, reduction fleet and the bait fleet. So the plot on the left gives the time series of landings information with the bait landings overlaid with the black line there. And we see a variable pattern in reduction landings through time, peaking in nearly 700,000 metric tons in the early, fifth, uh, early time period in the 1950s, and a, a pretty systematic decline in those landings uh, as expected because of the contraction of industry since about early 1990s. Um, bait landings, on the other hand, um, in the north and the south have tracked really closely together, but overall have increased um, since the, about 1990, um, such that prior to that time, they comprised roughly 10% of the total landings, and now that proportion is about 20%. Um, the bait landings still, there's some degree of uncertainty. They're, they're not super well captured in the database, but um, in recent years, we believe those data to be more reliable since reporting has, in, has improved. So this is the requisite information going, going into the assessment. The other part is sort of um, fishery independent data, so data collected from science um, agencies or uh, academic agencies, um, surveys. Um, these data represent survey information from all the states, Georgia, North to Rhode Island, in a combined fashion. And we have three plots that delineate um, survey trends over time for age one plus fish, and then the lower right plot for age zero or recruitment or young of the year fish. And they're really unremarkable to me in the sense that there's some variation from year to year, but there's no directional patterns over a long, relatively long time period. Um, admittedly, the age one plus in the north and the south only uh, track from 1990 to the present because those sampling programs didn't exist prior to then. We have a little bit more in the mid-Atlantic going back to 1985. And the most robust data sets go back to 1959 for young of year recruitment. Um, there's a little bit of contrast in the pattern um, in the recruitment index where the peak occurred in the late uh, six, or early 70s and in, into um, 1980s, but really um, nothing of any you know, major contrast in the directionality of abundance for any of these plots, really. And so you know, just to skip all the, the analytical stuff and get to the output of an assessment model, what the goal of the assessment model is to do is to combine that information and try to estimate fishing mortality and abundance and, and compare that to a reference level to determine if the stock is overfished or if overfishing is occurring. So the upper left plot is just a reproduction of the landings that you saw earlier. The upper right plot is the output from the assessment model where the shaded region indicates the biomass trend over time measured as uh, millions of metric tons. And the blue line represents the uh, recruitment pattern generated by the model, so not the observed one we saw, but the model predicted one. So the model predicted recruitment pattern has been pretty variable but level since mid-1970s, and biomass has been increasing systematically since about mid-1980s. The bottom two plots are the ones we use to infer something about stock status. So the lower left is the overfished, not overfished determination so what we see is a blue line solid that delineates the target. This you might want to think of as where you'd want the biomass to be from a fishery standpoint. And the dotted line would be the threshold for which you would not want biomass to drop below. In the last several years, um, the biomass predicted from the model has been bouncing around the target and is fairly well uh, away from the threshold. So this would lead to a not overfished determination. And then the lower right plot is the overfishing, not overfishing um, situation. So we flip it a little bit here. We want the green line, which is the fishing mortality rate for age two to four fish through time to be lower than the threshold, not above the threshold. The solid line again is the target and the fishing mortality rate in the last several years is below the target and well below the threshold. So the conclusion here is not overfishing uh, or overfishing is not occurring. So the, the model pr presents a pretty healthy um, and favorable uh, stock status for Menhaden. However, that doesn't mean that we know everything. Um, I like this plot because it makes me scratch my head and 
and illustrates that we still don't have perfect knowledge of all that's going on within this resource. So this is a plot on the x-axis or horizontal axis of fishing mortality rate from low to high. And on the vertical axis, age zero abundance or new recruitment. And so you can think of it as recruitment as a function of fishing. And the blue dots represent you know, all the data points, right? So we have areas where things are intuitive, and those are circled in green. So when we have high fishing mortality rate all the way to the right, we have some observations or some model predictions of low recruitment. So high fishing leads to low future generation size uh, abundances. We also have um, low F or low fishing mortality leading to high recruitment. So that would kind of follow the conventional wisdom. But then there's also some counterintuitive um, data points where we have low fishing and low recruitment and moderate to high fishing and high recruitment. And the point here is to illustrate that we really don't know a lot about the relationship between the stock size itself and the future recruitment, largely because recruitment is generated um, or modulated through environmental conditions in a, in a lot of ways. So. Um, I just bring this out as a, as a means to show that even though we have a working assessment model that has passed peer review, um, there's still a great deal of uncertainty and things that we don't fully understand. So to wrap up, we have a single genetic stock. There's movements up and down the coast and inshore. Growth is variable over time, largely modulated by environmental forcing, um, a declining trend in mean max size, which is something to keep an eye on. Larval abundance has been increasing, which may be a positive sign, but the survival of those larvae seems to be decreasing, which is not a positive sign. M is very high, age variable, um, but it's, it's high to account for the role of menhaden as forage. Um, reduction landings have decreased as expected given contraction of industry. Bait landings have increased more recently, um, and this can be attributed to a number of factors, but there's been higher demand for menhaden as um, as the situation with Atlantic herring has not gone well over recent years, so there's been higher demand from the north for bait landings. Um, no major coastwide patterns in the survey indices, and that the assessment model would suggest the stock is in, in overall good shape. Again, just kind of some really simple, basic stuff. Hopefully, to begin our um, our building of our you know of our understanding of the resource as we move forward and contemplate different management ideas and concepts. So with that, I will try to turn it over. I think I'll take questions if, if anyone has any after Shanna goes through her, her presentation. So Shanna, how do I unshare? Don't worry, Rob, we're going to steal it from you. No, nope, I just unshared, so hopefully you have it back. Yep, hold on just a second. All right, everybody should be able to see my screen now. Let's see if I can get this guy running. All right, does everybody see the big screen, not the note screen? Yes. Looks good to me. Yes. Excellent. Good. Okay, so as kind of a pairing to uh, Rob's presentation, I wanted to run us through some of the uh, history of Atlantic Manhattan uh, management through the years. So we're going to rewind all the way back to 1981 when uh, we first approved the coastwide FMP. Um, this FMP was pretty generic. Um, it didn't have any specific management actions, um, but in 1992, we did add some objectives to improve the data collection and promote fishery awareness. So, um, you know, I think we've kind of talked about this before when I went through the presentation last time, but um, ASMFC manages the coastwide stock of Atlantic Manhattan. Um, so this was the first FMP that ASMFC had put into place to sort of start to uh, regulate this fishery, but you know, without regulations at first. So uh, fast forward a little bit to uh, 2001, we put amendment one in place, which provided more management objectives, but yet again, um, no regulations. 
Um, at this point, we put an addendum in place, that's addendum one, and that implemented these biological reference points. And you guys have heard both Rob and myself talk about these biological reference points um, before. Those vary between species, they vary within species, um, and we modify those as our understanding of the stock um, increases and as, as things change with the stock. So, We've modified those through a series of um, different agenda throughout um, this time frame. So, addendum two was initiated in 2005, and this is the first place where we instituted a harvest cap on the reduction fishery in the Chesapeake Bay. Now, this cap was based off of average landings from 2000 through 2004, and they set the cap in place for the fishing years of 2006 through 2010. Um, and this addendum was approved in response to concern regarding the possibility of localized depletion occurring within the Chesapeake Bay. And some of the things that could go along with this idea of localized depletion are um, this could compromise predator prey relationships in the region. Obviously, at this point in time, we didn't have these ecological reference points in place, which we talked about at our last meeting. Um, and if there is localized depletion in the area, it could cause chronic uh, low recruitment of larval menhaden. So, this addendum really outlined a series of research priorities to examine the possibility of whether or not localized depletion was occurring in the Chesapeake Bay region, but the Bay cap was instituted as a way of kind of putting a cap in place um, and being more on the conservative side while we answered this important scientific question. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that um, as we continue on. So in 2006, um, Addendum 3 went into place and this revised the cap yet again. And this was now based off of average landings from 2001 to 2005. Um, and that cap was then put in place from 2006 to 2010. Um, during this time, there was a rollover. So essentially, if there was unused uh, quota in that cap yearly, you could roll over a certain amount um, of 13,000 metric tons. Um, addendum four extended that cap three additional years for 2011 to 2013. So this is a little bit of um, more quotes, I'd say ancient uh, Menhaden history. And now we're kind of being brought up into a uh, more current Menhaden history. So amendment two was put in place um, and started in 2013. And this was because the most recent stock assessment that was done in 2012 led to us finding out that Menhaden had an overfishing status. So in this amendment, uh, they maintain the reference points, but at this point established that total coastwide total allowable catch, which you hear us talk about this morning. Um, the TAC represented a 20% reduction in the average landings that were calculated from 2009 to 2011. It also established the state by state allocation, which we've talked about before. That was also based on average landings from 2009 to 2011. Um, it also put in a lot more reporting requirements. So we're actually getting timely reporting of landings because we now need to monitor this quota. Um, Amendment two also established a payback of overages. If you're going over your quota, you have to pay your quota back. And it also established quota transfers between different jurisdictions. So um, this is what our old Amendment 2 TAC allocations look like. Again, these allocations were based off of the average landings from 2009 to 2011. Um, as you can see, Virginia gets the majority of those landings. They were at about 85%. Um, and New Jersey had about 11. The remaining states accounted uh, for uh, only about 4% of the landings at this time. Um, Amendment 2 also established something that's still in place today. Uh, it is a 6,000 pound uh, bycatch allowance when you reach the quota. 
um, these bycatch landings don't count against a state's quota. So essentially, if our smaller fisheries um, go over their allotted quota, they still have this daily bycatch allowance um, that doesn't count over towards the overall quota. Um, and then two also established the episodic event set aside program. Um, this was put in place to allow some of the northeastern states to utilize the resource when Menhaden were in their area. That was dictated as 1% of the tax. That's actually still in place today. Um, and Amendment 2 also reduced the Chesapeake Bay cap because of the overfishing status. They reduced the cap 20% just like they did um, based off of those 2009 through 2011 landings. Um, they also reduced the max rollover from 13,000 to 10,000 metric tons. So Amendment 3 is what we are managing Menhaden currently under. Um, this document was approved back in 2017, implemented in 2018. Um, and in this document, the board decided to keep the single species biological reference points in place until those Menhaden specific ERPs were available. And that's what we talked about at the last meeting, how the board has implemented the ERPs and um, the entire process sort of surrounding that. Amendment three also changed the TAC allocations, the state-by-state -state allocations. Um, and in amendment two, it actually said that we need to revisit these state-by-state -state allocations every three years or so. And so the board decided that they wanted to balance the needs of the fishery and provide some future growth opportunities for the Northeastern states to utilize. Um, a few states also had some evidence of unreported landings from when that uh, time period was established. Um, and Amendment 3 also established a baseline quota for all states of at least half a percentage and then moved on to basing the rest of the TAC on average landings from 2009 through 2011. Right now, this is what the TAC allocation looks like. Um, as I said before, all of the states have that fixed minimum quota. Um, and once that's established, then we move on to using the average landings from 2009 through 2011 to establish allocations. Um, still 1% of that tax is set aside for the episodic event uh, program. And um, if that episodic event program isn't utilized that year for some reason, although it always has been in recent years, um, any of that leftover is allocated to the rest of the states using these uh, allocation percentages. Um, Amendment 3 also uh, slightly changed that bycatch allowance provision. Um, they just kind of changed the marketing, I'd say, on it. It's now called the incidental catch and the small scale fisheries provision. Um, we defined what those non directed fisheries and more small scale gears should look like that are allowed to use this bycatch allowance. And it kept that 6,000 pound uh, daily limit in place for those smaller scale gear types, but also allowed for um, people that are working from the same vessel um, using these stationary multi-species gear to land up to 12,000 pounds because there's two people working on that. Um, Amendment 3 also reduced the Chesapeake Bay cap to 51,000 metric tons. Um, the board cited reasons for this, such as the underperformance of the bay cap um, landing less than 50,000 metric tons in recent years. Um, they also got rid of the rollover provision, so there's no more rollovers from that 51,000 metric tons. Um, overages also need to be paid back in the very next calendar year. Those were new provisions that were added through Amendment 3. So now I kind of wanted to go into a little bit more of what's happening live with Menhaden management, uh, kind of what we can expect coming down the pipeline in the future um, and some things that the TCs and the boards have been talking about that we'll continue to keep this committee apprised of and, and things that you should kind of be on the lookout for. 
So I want to take a little bit of a step back to addendum two, which we talked about before is the first addendum where we really established that Chesapeake Bay cap. Um, that addendum also established something called the Atlantic Menhaden Research Program. And the program was designed to evaluate whether or not localized depletion was occurring in the Chesapeake Bay. Had a number of different uh, research goals. Um, those are listed right here. Menhaden abundance in the Chesapeake Bay, figuring out the removal of Menhaden by predators in the Bay, um, the exchange of Menhaden between the Bay and other coastal systems, as well as determining the recruitment of Menhaden into the Bay. So this program went on for a number of years and developed a lot of different projects. Um, and in 2009, the Center for Independent Experts sat down to review all of these projects as a package to determine whether or not these projects would be able to conclude if localized depletion is occurring in the Bay. So the review had three different reviewers. Um, and through these reviews, they were essentially unable to draw a conclusion of whether or not localized depletion is occurring in the Bay. Um, the reviewers kind of noted some things like they weren't really sure how the projects were um, going to be able to determine if localized depletion was occurring. They weren't sure how the projects were linked. Um, several reviewers noted that given the high mobility of Menhaden, they did not think localized depletion would be occurring, or if it was occurring, it would occur on a very small scale for a short period of time. Um, in the CIE review, all, all of the reviewers really focused on the fact that we needed to determine what the predator needs were, um, what Atlantic Menhaden's predator needs were. And so we've kind of talked through this last time you guys listened to me go on for 30 minutes about how these ecological reference points were established. We established the ecological reference points last year using this EcoPath with EcoSim model. Um, and we continue to use the single species assessment to draw short term projections. Um, however, much like our single species BAM model, our EcoPath with EcoSim model is built for a coastwide stock. And like Rob has talked about with you guys, um, the genetic evidence really suggests the stock is one genetically cohesive stock. Um, it's well mixed, and there is a lot of movement up and down the coast. Um, of Atlantic Menhaden. So this kind of question surrounding um, the bay cap kind of still remains. And in uh, the February meeting, the board specifically tasked the Atlantic Menhaden TC with a series of different questions that they're asking the TC to start working on. Um, and one of those being develop developing a spatially explicit regional model that would specifically um, be able to answer some of these unresolved questions surrounding the Chesapeake Bay uh, cap. Um, these uh, questions were discussed actually just yesterday on the TC call. I know a few of you were there. Um, and the TC is going to be producing a memo for the board's consideration at the upcoming May meeting week. Um, and the memo will outline some of our possible uh, modeling and research approaches to answering some of the questions that surround the bank cap. Um, I know that the TC will be asking the management board for some further guidance as to what their management objectives really are. Um, and that will kind of help guide whatever modeling or research recommendations end up coming from that technical committee. And like I mentioned previously, Amendment 3, like Amendment 2, requires that the board revisit the state-by-state -state allocation scheme every three years. So we've kind of hit this point right now with Amendment 3 that the board is starting to discuss um, whether or not the state-by-state -state allocations that were put in place by Amendment 3 are still appropriate or if they need to be revisited. The board has not yet made a decision on that. But at the winter meeting, again, back in February, several of the New England states that have been utilizing that episodic event set aside program um, and transfers from other states have requested that we sit down and revisit those allocations um, to give them a little bit more management stability. They're saying that it's 
uh, very hard for them to plan um, on knowing when they can and can't catch Manhattan with the um, allocation that they currently have. Um, at this May meeting, the board will sit down and discuss whether or not they want to initiate a management document. Um, and if they do choose to initiate a management document, the timeline on that will vary just depending on what sort of document they decide to go with. They can go with an addendum, which would be a quicker, faster pro uh, process. But if there's a lot of things that the board wants to change about management, they might opt to uh, use an amendment process uh, to kind of go ahead and move forward with some of the other questions that they might um, have for the management of this species. Uh, and with that, I am happy to uh, take any questions or if you guys have questions for Rob, we now would be the time. Yes, yeah, thanks, Shanna. That was um, so questions for me or Shanna on basic biology and data or history of management from uh, members of the committee. So I'd say at this point, just unmute yourself, identify and, and ask questions if you have any. Hey, this is Chris. Um, I, I'll start, I guess. And it, one of the things I know, uh, Sh Rob and Shanna, um, that I had requested for this meeting was to look at some of the fishery independent data sets, um, accessory for Virginia. And I know Rob obviously did a, a thorough job talking about the coastwide data sets and things like that, but we seem to have missed talking about any of those data sets that we have in Virginia, like the SANE survey or the trawl survey. And I was wondering, is, could we just not pull those together in time, or is that something you all were going to present at another time? Um, I'll take, I'll start off. We, we certainly could pull the data, Chris, um, but I guess it was, um, my decision at this point to emphasize the coastwide nature of Manhattan. The same survey data you refer to are, have been incorporated at every step of the way, so they're in there. Um, I just at this point wanted to keep things at the coastwide level just to set the background stage and, and make sure that all, all the committee members were op operating on the notion that there really is kind of a coastwide process here. Um, and not dive down too deeply into a localized spatial um, region. Uh, in future meetings, if you want to see those data, I'd say um, put forth a request, put forth um, your, you know, your needs, your, your, your request for how you want them summarized, and we can try to aid that process. Um, but I'd ask you to do that with a certain idea in mind if you have. One, rather than just look at trends, um, is there a certain you know type of question you're you're posing to us to to address for the discussion of the committee? Yeah, well, I, I think it's important that we look at at both the coastwide trends and also what's happening in the state. Um, obviously, we're an advisory committee to um, the managers for the state of Virginia, and so I, I think we should also be thinking about what's happening in the state waters. Um, at the same time, looking at what's happening um, over over the coastwide population as well, and um, I'm happy to resubmit that request with some more details um, for the reasoning for the next meeting. That would be great. Thanks. Other questions from committee members? Yeah, Rob. Yeah. This is AJ, I have a question. Uh, yep. Go right ahead, AJ. Um, so I guess, uh, and I appreciate that, you know, that there's kind of a, um, larger big picture here that you're doing with the coast wide. Discussion and, and, um, I do agree with Chris that, you know, we, we are, uh, MBAC is looking at a state level and we're advising the MRC and, you know, we get our charge and everything. We've been through that. Um, I'm wondering if, um, someone can, maybe you or Shane or, um, somebody at VMRC can break down for the committee, um, what exactly is involved with management at the state level at VMRC since that change was made um, in the legislature from, you know, Richmond down to um, the agency? What specifically is um, under the purview and jurisdiction of VMRC for management of Menhaden? I can take that, Rob, if you'd like. 
Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say that. That's a good question. Thanks, Shanna. Yeah, yeah. Um, so AJ, I, I'd say not too much has changed in that. Um, essentially, what happened when management was passed to VMRC is certain parts of the code were stricken, um, and those parts of the code were taken by us and put into regulation instead of code. So the things that are under regulation now are the same things that were in code, but they're just under VMRC regulation. Um, I think we stepped through the regulation maybe at the first MMAC meeting we ever had. Um, so I don't know if you have a if you have a specific question as to, you know, what's what specifically the regulation covers or. Uh. No, I appreciate that it was taken basically from, you know, the, the legislature and the language was turned into regulation. I get that. I guess um, for the benefit of the committee members, I guess, what is VMRC managing? Because it's a federally managed species on, as Rob said, the coastwide, you know, stock. Um, but for example, um, you know, the, the bay reduction quota, that's managed at ASMFC? Or yeah. that's managed at VMRC? Well, so the, yes, the bay cap is managed through ASMFC. Um, so any changes that would take place to the bay cap would come down through ASMFC. Um, same with the quota, we've updated the quota, like uh, at the last meeting we talked about, we updated the quota based off of those ecological reference points. Again, that came down through um, ASMFC. Um, Virginia, the way that Virginia allocates the quota itself that was already established i know we talked about that last time as well um the virginia allocation i actually have a slide here on it if we if you want to have a look um but i know you guys kind of know all those percentages here sure let me pop that up for you so all of this all of our quota is put into regulation with each of our su uh, sectors um, percentages already slotted out. Um, and that is something that um, Virginia itself would manage, for instance, the ASMFC does not take a role in. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And AJ, if I'm not mistaken, um, Shanna, correct me if I'm wrong, there are still two issues that remain with the legislature, and that is um, the GA still has authority over fishing season and fishing areas, including the areas that are prohibited. Is, am I correct on that? Yes. Rob, this, Rob, this is Pat. In, in the areas, it, there's a, a little statement that, it, that says something about um, except as noted in commission regulation. So okay. we, we have the ability to. You know, we don't, you know, we don't have the, I, I, I'm assuming ones that are there, we don't have, we may not have the ability to alter, but there's a little thing in there that says, you know, unless noted in, in commission regulation, these are the, these are the areas. So, right. So take home here, AJ, is that, you know, we're with, with all of our coastwide species, species that that traverse state lines, you know, we're, we're operating at the level of ASMSC first and then states take what comes out of those um, board deliberations and has a little bit of leeway to modify things um, within state waters, but but certainly not at a level that would um, go against what the FMP or what the prescribed management is in, in terms of compliance. So the latitude may not be as wide as um, in, other, in other fisheries. Yeah, that's good background and I appreciate it. I think it's helpful for the committee. Other questions from committee members? Hey, Sh this is Chris again, sorry. Um, I'll let someone else go if they want, but I, I did want to ask Shanna to to maybe put that um, slide back up with the quota allocations for the Commonwealth. And ask a question there. Um, Thanks, Shanna. I, I, one question I had is, is, are all of our sectors catching their allotted quota over, say, the last five years? Um, you know, has Virginia been getting quota through transfers from other states, or are we transferring quota out? Um, I, I know we, 
we can't necessarily get exact data, but wanted to get a feel for, you know, were these sectors at least uh, around their quota uh, given the last four or five years? Sorry, I tried to unmute myself and just stop sharing. Apologies, Chris. <laughs> no problem. There you go. Um, yeah, so you're right. I think you and I have kind of had this talk before regarding uh, confidentiality um, and, and things like that. So I'm, I'm only kind of allowed to speak broadly. Right. Um, so, yes, these sectors are catching close to their quota. Um, We, so one of the things that we looked at during the allocation discussions at the last board meeting is, is overall how close are people um, getting to their overall quota and Virginia is always in the 90th percentile. So um, our sectors are all utilizing their quota. Um, in recent years, we haven't needed to use the, like, let's say, in this past year, we haven't needed to utilize that bycatch allowance, but in recent times, we have utilized that bycatch allowance with that small scale non per same bait sector. Um, so yeah, I can't I can't quite get into exact numbers, but yes, those all three sectors utilize their quotas. Thank you. Uh, this is Mike Leonard. I had a, another question. Go ahead, Mike. Thanks. Um, so, Shannon, just piggybacking on the the bycatch allowance, I'm just curious because um, in my head, if you take six thousand pounds and multiply it out by 365 days times however many fish, it can get to be a lot of fish. I, it's I'm assuming those the fish caught within that six thousand pound bycatch allowance are reported, captured, counted in some form, and, and to clarify, are they counted against the quota or not? They are not counted against the quota, but yes, they are counted. Um, it is not a significant amount in comparison to the rest of the quota. So okay. we haven't, we utilize it sometimes, um, and I know that you doing that quick math, it can seem like a lot, um, it's not often that we need to utilize that, um, and when we do, it's not a significant amount. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. But yes, all of that still needs to be reported. It all goes through our mandatory reporting system, and that goes to ASMFC ultimately. Maybe hey, time for one more. If, yeah, if, if, this, if, this if, is Steve. I got, I got a question, Rob, this is probably for you. Uh, referencing back to that slide that you described as a bit of a head scratcher. Um, I'm wondering if, um, and I, I, don't, I don't think you need to put it back up necessarily, but I'm wondering if uh, some of that head scratching could be explained by changes in the age or, I may not use the words right, age or maturity of the Menhaden being caught, you know, over one period of time versus another. Does is do do we have any information about that at all? In other words, the fish that are caught during those times where it was a head scratcher, w w did they tend to be younger fish or older fish? Right. Um, so that's a good question. I neglected to tell you that the the structure of the model is that that's underpinning the output that you saw on that slide is age-based. So changes in the the amount of H2 or H3 or 4 fish that are captured are reflected in the analysis, as are changes in um, maturity or growth. All of those variable plots I showed you are also included in, and accounted for in the in the analysis. So. To the degree we can, we're trying to capture um, all of those phenomena that are that are seemingly unfolding in the population. Um, now, you know whether whether the number of age two fish in one year is higher or lower than the number of age two fish caught in a subsequent year or some other year. Um, 
it, it's a complicated thing to try to interpret, right? Because you have different sized year classes that are that are moving through the ages. You have different fishing patterns based on what industry is deciding to do. Um, you have different uh, you know amounts of fishing effort. All these things. So there's really not a direct um, obvious linkage sometimes that you, that you can establish to say, yeah, yes, this is what's happening, which is why it's a bit of a head scratcher. But um, we still don't have a good understanding of of the relationship between the abundance of adults and future recruitment of age zero fish. It's just for for a species like menhane, it's just something very difficult to nail down. And menhane is not alone. If you look at other forage fishes in other parts of the U.S. or even the world, um, very similar kinds of patterns emerge. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Rob, it's Chris again. Could I actually kind of add a follow on to that and ask you to put up a slide from your presentation? Sure. The, uh, the slides where you had the young of the year, it was four, four graphs. Uh, I think you had young of the year, one plus, and a couple other ones in your presentation. Yeah, I just need to grab the. Um... You should be able to now, Rob. What am I? Where's the little button? Share, which screen do I want? And this one? Yeah, that one. Um, mm -hmm. When describing that, I noticed you said that you didn't see a lot of concern here. And um, I just wanted to touch on the young of the year there. You know, I, looking at that, at least from my view, um, when I think, I kind of think back in some ways to what we've seen with blue crabs in Chesapeake Bay, where it seems as though not only have we kind of lost abundance, but we also, we also lost some of that inner annual variance that we tend to see in fisheries. And, um, could you talk a little bit more about that when it comes to the young of the year slide? Cause it definitely looks like we're, we've lost both abundance and, and variability, which I would think we would see in a species that is so, uh, dependent upon weather conditions um, on a year-to-year -year basis. Yeah, sure. A couple things here. One is um, these are relative indices that are plotted, which means they're not absolute abundances. So okay. we have to be we have to be careful to interpret changes over time as actual uh, full magnitudes of fish. Um, there, it's an index of the abundance, so it's an indicator. Number two, I, unfortunately, this plot isn't ideal because of the uncertainty in the 70s, stretches the scale of the vertical, ax, vertical axis so high, so it kind of dwarfs the variability you might see in the more recent years. Um, number three, the data that go into this young of the year plot back in the 50s and into the um, early 70s and mid 70s are largely driven by the, the Maryland SANE survey because some of the other sampling programs didn't exist. They didn't start until the 80s. Um, so this is a conglomerate type index where all data are contributing, but but not all data span the entire time frame. And I've worked with these data a lot, and I can tell you that, that in the 70s, there are some observations in the SANE survey where, and I believe them to be true approximately, but there are catches in there of 25 or 30,000 Menhaden in one single 300-foot SANE haul, which Obviously, as an estimate, I don't doubt that the biologists saw and filled their bag full of menhaden, but, you know, to the degree that there may be some uncertainty there, um, I'm not sure. And it, it's so long ago that we don't have the ability to go back and really look at it. But what the effect of those few observations is, is it pulls that index up um, in that period of time pretty high relative to the others. Um, and if you look at the full time series, that high period in the 70s is now sort of the the minority um, range of recruitment patterns um, or recruitment uh, levels when you compare the the, the full time series. And lastly, we don't see relationship between these perceived high year classes and the adult subsequent year index um, values. There's not good correspondence between them. So suffice it to say that the data are noisy and and there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, so much so that that I guess that was underpinning, you know, my my comment earlier that um, I don't see a lot of concern here because the fisheries have been trucking along 
for all this time, and the assessments keep predicting that um, you know the, the stock status is favorable. So it, when you look at different lines of evidence, it doesn't seem like there's a major issue. Rob, this is Pat. If I could just chime in a little bit on that, since I worked on the Charles survey and the Sane survey, you know, Menhaden is one of those species, like you said, you can you can go the whole you know the whole summer on the Sane survey and only you know catch one or two here or there, and all of a sudden you catch a thirty thousand fish toe, and that's going to drive that in, that index for the year. That's that's going to drive it. And the same thing on the Charles survey. You just didn't see a whole lot. You, you, you didn't see a whole lot of them, but sometimes when you did, they were very large numbers, and that's probably one of the reasons why, the you know Troy and Mary and when I was there as well, we didn't feel comfortable creating an estimate, you know, any kind of um, estimate of uh, relative abundance because you know the they didn't occur that often. The frequency of occurrence wasn't that great, and then when we did catch them, we, we, we it was driven by one or two catches. So I, I, I agree with what you were saying with those large catches you know, driving these these estimates higher. Mind I you that um, all of these plots that you see are derived from data from surveys that are not designed to capture Menhaden. We don't have any dedicated sampling programs, fisheries independent, for Manhattan. So these are bycatch of other existing survey platforms. Yeah. Thanks for that explanation. I appreciate it. Sure. Thanks. Um, I think in the interest of time, we should move on. Um, if there are other questions on these issues, happy to, to take them. Maybe send me an email and or send the group an email. We can do it electronically. Let me um, turn this. Back to Shanna. So that was intended to be background just to kind of get everybody sort of starting on the same page. I, I like the questions about, you know, looking at things in a, in a more um, directed way. I think we can move, do that as we move forward. But I, I felt it important to um, kind of set the stage at least, you know, globally or coastwide um, from the start. So we're going to move on to. Um, Next item on the agenda, which um, represents some discussion that we'll have regarding two issues that have been raised for the committee to deliberate over. Um, and just to remind you, in our November 2020 meeting, we sort of outlined a procedure where if, a, if there's an issue that, that an individual committee member wants to bring to the table for the committee's discussion, the onus is to some degree on that individual to kind of formulate what the issue is and, and gather any evidence or information um, that might be pertinent in his background or supportive. Um, so Steve Atkinson has done that for the two items that are on the agenda regarding um, user conflicts near Virginia Beach and the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. Um, so Steve, I'm, in a moment I'm going to turn the floor over to you to kind of present your ideas and your thoughts on these issues and then since this is kind of a commercial recreational um, discussion, Monty has agreed to sort of describe some of the things that his organization has done or, or has continued to do through time um, as additional relevant background information. We'll let both of those presentations go, um, open the floor for discussion or questions from committee. Um, the discussions will end there unless there's a a feel for a motion of some kind to consider more formally, um, at which time we may consider public comment and then ultimately a, a vote if that actually comes to be. So that's kind of the plan as I see it. Um, Steve and Shanna, I know you've been communicating. What, are we going to see something on the screen from Steve or, or Steve, are you just going to speak to the issue regarding, I guess, the first one on the list here is conflicts near Virginia Beach? Yes, Rob, uh, I was just going to speak to it. I think everybody received the, uh, the document. Uh, yep. Hopefully every, everybody had a chance to see that and I was just going to quickly run through that and try to provide the, uh, the rationale. Yeah, that's fine. Um, just wanted to get up to speed on how we're going to view it. So that's great. Um, Steve, why don't you take the floor and, um, you know, outline what you're thinking here? 
Yeah, sure. So, so over the years as a recreational angler and, and, uh, you know, I, I've observed some of this myself and I've heard stories and we've had, uh, members of the Virginia saltwater sport fishing association comment about this, but there have been conflicts or perceived conflicts between the reduction boats and saltwater anglers. Most of that seems to have occurred around the area of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. That's largely because there's quite a bit of boating traffic in that area. Um, and and it's, it's not documented. Honestly, I don't think people, if, if there was some kind of an issue or conflict, I don't even believe they know who they would report that to. So, so there is no real documentation. What I'm suggesting is that in the interest of safety, given the high level of traffic around the CBBT, uh, I would propose, or certainly we ought to consider establishing a, I called it a safety buffer, but um, essentially a, an area around the CBBT where there would be no uh, per seine netting. I believe the current regulation is within 500 yards of the bridge. I would propose uh, a mile either side of the bridge, uh, simply just to provide more separation between the per seine boats and the uh, recreational anglers. And in, in, again, in the vicinity of the bridge. Um, and again, I, I, I won't read all of this. I, I, I did provide some examples of some of the conflicts that people have talked about. Um, and I just think in the interest of safety, having a a buffer that's larger than 500 yards would, would be a good thing. And then the, the final point on that first proposal would be, you know, maybe we need to consider some sort of a process so that there is some conflict that people would even know who to report that to. And, and by the way, I want, I want to be clear. I think I'm sure there, I'm sure Monty can share stories uh, about conflicts in the other direction. I know there have been cases where um, anglers have harassed some of the per seine boats as well, be it on the radio or, or whatever. Uh, so I don't want to suggest that this is just a, a one-way street. Okay. Thank you, Steve. So um, if you're following the agenda, we're operating under point B, the safety zone for the Bay Bridge Tunnel. Um, and Steve has suggested there's some potential for interaction and conflict, maybe perceived, maybe real, um, and is suggesting consideration of a um, establishing a safety buffer. So Monty, are you um, able to speak to that from your perspective? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I, I can hear you. I dropped off about four times during the hour, um, but I'm back on now. Uh, there are a couple of uh, slides that I think maybe uh, Pat or Shanna are controlling that might help the conversation. Yep, I've got those one on just. We have them. I don't think they're in the same order though, but that's okay. Are we getting that up there? Yep. Hold on just a okay. second. Okay. So just some data for the group, you know, that, that's been collected for five years from 2016 to 19. Uh, Shannon, if you hit the next next slide. Thanks. So what, what we wanted to show you was a copy of a C, what we call a CDFR. It's a captain's daily fishing report. And most of the data that's collected in the per seine industry, not just the reduction sector, but also the bait sector comes from these CDFRs. So every time one of our vessels makes a set, you'll see that this particular example, the vessels Calcutta Pass, 
the date is at the top right. And every time on that date that he makes a set, he has to log in the start time of that set. And a set for us is when we circle the net, bring the fish back together and pump them onto the uh, mother vessel. He has to document the start of that set, the end time of that set, how many fish he estimates were in that set. And they, these captains are pretty good. They can usually get within five or so percent um, of how many were in there. And that, by the way, is in thousands. What spotter plane set them on that set? Uh, there's a CDFR code for the nearest landmark uh, on land that they have to memorize uh, the exact lat long of that set, how many miles to shore you can read across, and even the codes for the environmental conditions at the time. Now, where this goes from there and how it's used, Rob can do a much better job explaining that, how the scientists use it. But I, I wanted to just start the basis where you know, this is the start of the data collection, you know, for the purseine industry. So if you if you if you notice, I'll, I'll make a comment that this form is on a colored form from NOAA. And it is it is read using a 1960s Scantron machine. Um, we we would love to go to an electronic reporting in this industry. We do it for everything else except for this form because uh, NOAA still just uses that Scantron. And if you notice some of the numbers, particularly when you look at Latin long, if that Scantron misreads a nine to a one or, or something, there can be some minor errors in, in some of the, the set plotting that you may see on some slides that we'll show you in a little bit. Um, Janet, do you go to the, the next slide? So these are just some percentages over, over the five years uh, to show you what is has been caught in the bay uh, versus in the ocean uh, and, and even broken out month by month. You know, back about 20 years ago, around 65 to 75% of the fish caught in this industry were caught in the bay and uh, the other caught outside of the bay. Um, starting in about 2010, we actually made a conscious decision here uh, to try to fish as much outside of the bay as we could when weather permitted and when there was fish available and just avoid the bay. And, and it was mainly to avoid conflicts that were happening. Um, some of those things that, that Steve mentioned earlier, uh, we just tried to get away from it. Um, it. It worked and we went from the five year period around 05 to 2010, um, catching close to 100,000 metric tons of fish in the bay a year, to after that, we went down to about 51,000 metric tons of catching fish in the bay a year. Now, you know, I see that as a good thing. Um, you know, the, the thing that came back and bit us was that then ASFMC said, well, since that's what you have averaged, that's what we're going to make your new maximum which you know, we certainly did not agree with that. Anybody that's in the fishing business or the farming business knows that, that any time you take an average and now make that your new maximum, uh, it's gonna have you know, repercussions on, on the business because you're still gonna have those lower years. But, but overall now we've gotten to the point over the years that we're catching about 75, uh, 25. Some years are different, um, you know, no two years are alike, but uh, you can see in, uh, you know, how it's been over the last few years. Any, any questions on this? Monty, just keep going. We'll take, we'll take questions at the end. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right, Shannon, go ahead. Sorry. So here's a plot. Here's, you know, obviously a map of the, the lower mouth of the bay um, where we're talking about one of these, uh, you know, one of these restriction zones that Steve mentioned. You know, we obviously, you know, would would not like to see this happen. Um, you know, the, the the bridge has been in operation since 1964. You know, we've been fishing, you know, since the 1800s. We've never had a vessel interaction with that bridge. Um, you know, common sense obviously has to prevail. You know, our captains and in, in, at this particular company have an average of 34 years experience uh, among them. You know, it takes them eight to 10 years to get their Coast Guard 1600 captain's license. 
and uh, and that is not something that they would want to jeopardize by by being unsafe around the bridge. You know, there are only six vessels that fish at this at this plant anymore. There are two other bait vessels, which you know, I'm not going to try to speak for, but both of the captains on those have 40 plus years experience uh, in this industry. So, you know, based on experience, um, you know, they feel safe often. You know, getting closer to the bridge, if you're on the outside of the bridge and, you know, ebb tides about to start. You certainly feel safer if a spotter plane sees a school of fish. In an area that is safe to catch, you certainly feel safe going in, catching it and leaving. As opposed to if you're on the inside of the bridge, you know, you typically aren't going to set within 4 or 5 miles of that bridge when ebb tide is going to start. So. You know, obviously, for a long, long time, they have used very good discretion and avoided any any uh, contact or any issues around the bridge. Now, you know, to to address the Steve's uh, other point about you know recreational uh, uh, maybe user conflicts, you know, the best I can tell you is that you know about three years ago we had a daily press reporter come on one of our boats, and you know he saw. He saw firsthand how our captains all interacted with you know, recreational fishing boats. And, you know, I would invite anyone to go back and, and read that article by Dave Ress, where he, you know, pointed out the, the conscious effort that these guys make to avoid, you know, getting close to sports fishermen and just getting out of their way, particularly, you know, if they're in an area first. Now, if we're in an area first fishing and, you know, people come near us, then, you know, I, it, it's a it's a difficult thing for us to pack up very quickly and leave an area, but you know I don't know I've never been called by VMRC uh, and and had a complaint against us because we have you know been unsafe around a recreational fisherman. Um, you know most all of our all of our captains are extremely professional. Uh, this is their livelihood. They've been doing this a very long time. You know, I, Steve mentioned a, you know, the, the possibility of a, uh, a hotline or something to call. Um, you know, I certainly, we have actually called VMRC in the past uh, when, when we have been, you know, through unsafe actions, been, been harassed. Um, certainly not against something like that, but just, you know, just remember um, anything like that should be thoroughly investigated. And in this industry, we only have eight boats to, to, to worry about and deal with. And around that, you know, bridge, you've got thousands and thousands of people who can, uh, you know, who are all independent and, uh, you know, many could have a mind of their own. So I, I guess I have not seen an issue here, um, but I'm certainly open, you know, to someone if they'd like to discuss this more. I, we haven't had any, uh, any any bad interactions, um, and and I guess I would hate to see fishing grounds, you know, taken away that can be safely used um, for something like this. Are there, is there another slide, Channel? I can't remember. Yeah, there's a couple more. Okay. So there's some of the sets uh, that have been made in that in that time frame near the bridge. You know, I'll point out that the dots uh, are inflated so that you can see them. Uh, you know, the uh, the circumference of the net is not that large uh, in in comparison to the map, but it's it's been over exaggerated some so that you can see them. Okay. So, so Monty. This is Steve. Just a question on that. So it, it does appear that some of the sets are made almost adjacent to the bridge. Is am I seeing that correctly? Well, if you look at it, you would say some of them are on top of the bridge, which is why I mentioned you know the the, the fallacy of the of using the of using the scantron and then the size of the circles that have to be put on here so that we can see them. You know that that net is about 200 feet in diameter across. And you can see these, if you know, you know that bridge tunnel is what, 17, 17 or so miles. Um, yep. you know, this is not to scale. 
and the thing is, Steve, you're talking about when someone's putting, you know, entering coordinates, I will tell you from my personal experience, that is the one thing that people probably write down, make mistakes writing down the most of. I mean, working at BIMS for 14 years and doing 20,000 trawls, that was the biggest mistake we had in our database was someone, you know, making a mistake on entering a coordinate. So, but I think the point is, it's the, the low number that are occurring in that area. And we don't, you know, we don't hang around that area. You know, we only go in that area when a spotter plane sees a school of fish that we want to catch. We go in there in about 40 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes, we are gone. You know, the bridge is not somewhere you just uh, drift and uh, hang around. Okay, next, next slide, Chair. Yeah, sure. Is there any more? There are no more slides on this particular topic right now. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, Steve mentioned something about a 500 yard buffer or something to that effect. And sorry, I'm not up on this, but Pat or Shanna, do you, can you articulate whether there are any regulations for safety in place for anything like? Recreational, commercial, or otherwise, like what? what what's the current landscape on this? We, we do have some regulations as far as um, some of our commercial gears and how close they can be set to the to the bridge tunnel. Um, I'm not sure about many, and I'd have to look that up. Um, but if you go back, if you go back two slides, Shanna, I mean, this is a caution area that is well defined in purple. You go back two slides. Well, you can see it right there off to the lower left. I mean, it, it is it is well defined as a NOAA area, you know, a half a half mile on each side. It's well defined as a caution area, and, and, and these are the definitions right from the NOAA charts. I mean, it's just, you know, it's an area that you're supposed to use an extreme caution while you're in. Um, so um, it's um, I'd have like I said, I, I'd have to check for the Menhaden fleet whether or not they're what what proximity they're allowed. Within the bridge tunnel, I know for some of like uh, gill nets and a couple other ones is, is a certain crab pots as well. They have a certain distance that I think it's uh, I, I can't remember. I think it's different by each gear. It, it goes up to 500 yards, but it could be as little as 200 yards. Okay, that's fine. I was just curious. Um, the other you know, thing I was going to ask. Sorry. Um, I was just going yeah. to note that most of that gear Pat mentions is stationary gear. Yeah. It's going to it's going to stay yeah. there through yeah. several tide cycles. Yeah. You know, I mentioned before that you know we only go in you know obviously when it's safe and the tide's going to be in the right direction. We, you know, we catch a school of fish and we leave. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Thank you, Monty. Um, Pat, do you have any information from complaints or? Or, or anything to that effect on either side of this discussion? Uh, 11 complaints that we could find. Um, a lot of those complaints were, you know, and, and all we did was research the terms menhaden, omega protein, fish kills, those kind of things. And most of them dealt with, um, most of them dealt with fish spills, which we are well aware of. I mean, we're, you know, we're always notified of those, but overall there was only 3 that had interactions. There was 1 where an Omega vessel called complaining about recreational anglers. Uh, there was 1 about a recreational angler complaining that. Um, Omega vessels, you know, came where he was fishing and it was 1 where a commercial fisherman claimed that the. Omega vessel dropped their gear on his pound net, which I don't know how that's possible, but that was the complaint. So um, we have, and and on each one of those cases, it's 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 if we get a call into our into our dispatcher, it's it's dealt with. I mean, law enforcement officers will go and they'll investigate it, and and they open a case on it. So it's, um, and and it it does it does involve. I mean, I I have a few of these. I mean, a lot of them have names on them, so I don't really want to share them, but. A lot of them have a lot of details like, you know, if someone, you know, one of them we had somebody was, I guess, at the beach in Smith Point was complaining because there were, you know, three boats in the distance that they saw all day and 
you know, it didn't smell right to them and they thought something was wrong and they wanted someone to come out and do, you know, water samples because they didn't feel it was right and they didn't feel safe to go swimming. Well, you know, law enforcement made a point of going over there and, and collecting some water samples and getting them to DEQ and um, those kind of things. So they do a thorough check on it and they, and they try to investigate, you know, the person calling and ask them a bunch of questions. Um, you know, uh, somebody had said early to me that, you know, Rob O'Reilly had received a couple of phone calls. I was trying to search through his emails. I couldn't find anything in that. So I figured, you know, the best documentation we have is our incident reports to our law enforcement. And if we do, you know, decide to do something, you know, I don't want to put more work on them, but that's the place it should probably go because that's an official avenue. You, you know, if somebody has a concern and they want to file a complaint, they should be doing it through our law enforcement, you know, rather than having some website or some app where they can basically, you know, just put something in and then we have, you know, there's no checks and balances on it. So, um, uh, so there is an avenue that we could do with law enforcement, you know, that people can call in if they do have concerns. Um, and, um, you know, what, you know, I don't know how, I don't know how many calls we'd get though. That's the problem. So. Okay, thanks. Um, hey, Rob, so this is AJ. Point, yeah, I was just going to open it up for more general discussion from the committee. So, AJ, go right ahead, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so, as a representative of the first thing bait um, sector, which, you know, we have very few boats, relatively speaking, um, we do fish near the Bay Bridge Tunnel. I'm unaware of any user conflicts that, that's occurred. I think it's also important to understand that we don't have any intention on hanging nets um, in the Chesapeake Bay uh, uh, on the bridge tunnel, not only for safety reasons for, for our fishing industry uh, and the recreational industry if they happen to be, ha happen to be out there, uh, but also the gear itself. Um, these nets obviously are expensive uh, and there's really no need to run the risk in those conditions to be so close to the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. Um, so again, I'm unaware of any um, user conflicts with regards specifically to the to the bait industry, um, but I would oppose this um, proposal. Okay, thank you, AJ. Um, let's keep it at discussion level at this point, and and we'll vote if we need to if it gets to that level. Um, any other comments or discussion points or questions from the committee for Steve or Monty? I, this is Ken. Can you hear me? Yeah, who is that? Um, sorry, I can't hear your name. Is that Ken? This is, this is Ken. Can you hear me? There's a little bit of static, but try, try and go ahead, Ken. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm just, I have a question for Monty. I'm, I'm just wondering if he can specify or quantify how the reduction of fishing would be adversely impacted if it could not fish within a mile or even a half a mile or, or whatever arbitrary distance. Uh, it, I, I don't hear uh, anything specific about how much this would take away from their ability to catch. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Monty. Can you? Um, yeah. I mean, we've looked at it. You know, it could be a couple of percentage, a couple of percentages of our overall catch. And again, you know, we don't we don't go in that area unless it's you know well worthwhile because we don't want to be in that area anyway. Um, but it's a it's a fishing ground that you know when that's the only place that there's a, somewhere to fish. You know, we certainly would like to be able to go in there as we've done for a century and done safely. Okay. All right. Any other discussion? I, hey, this is this is Chris. I, I think one thing might be helpful if if we just continue to discuss this, possibly at a, a later meeting as well. Um, Pat mentioned the other gears and the regulation, but he obviously didn't have all of them in front of him. Might be something 
worthwhile to do to compare what gear, what other regulations are currently in effect for other gears uh, might give us a little bit better background on what the MRC has done uh, with other type of gears um, over the over the history, least recent history. Um, this is Mike Leonard. I had a question about the data we're looking at here. Is this um, an average over multiple or a sum of multiple years? Is this one particular year? How far back are we going with the, the data we're looking at right in front of us? This is four years of data. <laughs> yeah. 2016 through 2019. So just just a comment on that. This is Steve. Um, so, just to clarify, the uh, this thing that shows the sets that are within that buffer zone. Uh, that's that's a four year picture. So there's only been that many sets within that buffer zone in the last four years. That is correct. Okay. Well, so what I'm what I'm it kind of goes back to Ken's comment. I'm looking at the uh, data here on the chart, and it says uh, the total number of sets was 39, which which represents uh, a third of 1% of effort. So I'm just, I'm having a hard time understanding how there would be a big impact if suddenly these 39 sets didn't occur in that in that safety zone. Yeah, and, and I guess I'm having the exact opposite. I'm, I'm, I'm having the, uh, you know, I'm having the problem. I'm having the issue of seeing where is the problem if we're if we're in there those thirty some odd times over a four year period, and, and we've done always done it safely. I mean, do, are we do we want to regulate it just to regulate it? No, that's certainly not my intent. Again, the intent here is to just provide some physical separation between what can be hundreds of recreational boats in that area and the purse seine boats. That's that's all. Um, and again, we we part of our problem here, admittedly, is we lack documentation. We don't know. We really don't know, other than the few instances that Pat mentioned, we just don't know to what degree there's been conflict. Uh, Monty, there may have been anglers that never said a word, but felt like they were somehow, um, you know, invited to leave an area because the, the purse scenes showed up. Um, but, you know, they didn't get on the radio and holler about it and they didn't call VMRC. So, again, it's, it's an unknown quantity. Hey, this is Dan Nott. I'd like to make a comment as well. Sure, go right ahead, please. Yeah, as as a commercial guy out there, I don't fish around the uh, Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel at all. Um, but you know, I get the same. I get quite a few complaints, just gill netting and stuff like that. And most of them are kind of just unfounded or unwarranted, I guess. You know, people complaining about a gill net being in a channel when it's not. Um, or you know they just not understanding how the how the gill nets are marked and so i know that's not what you know people have an issue with uh you know omega or the purse saying boats but i do hear a lot of people complaining about just commercial fishing in general and and a lot of them are unfounded but i would also say just being out there on a daily basis and hearing the radio calls whether you've listened to channel 68 or what it is for the recreational side is that you know it's almost like I, will, I listen to it sometimes during busy summer days just it's it's or you know days it's comical because folks are almost looking for the omega boats and they all kind of group together almost like in a harassment and so you know it's just it's interesting to see this and then you see the some of the social media posts from like uh, Menhaden defenders or Chesapeake Bay defenders, and, and you see where they're actually following the spotter planes. And as they follow the spotter planes, they're they're promoting it on the radio, 
to go and see and kind of get in the way of the Menhaden Steelers of the Bay. And so I would just throw that out there that, that some of this might be unfounded. And I would say that everybody that's kind of listening to it should go to some of those sites and just kind of see what they post and how, you know, it could almost be more of a reverse interaction where the recreational boaters are actually going and getting in the way of Omega on purpose. And so I think it's fascinating that we're having this conversation and there's only been three reported interactions. I know if I have an issue out on the water, the first person I'm gonna call is the VMRC, um, you know, the Marine police officers to report it. So that's just my uh, two cents on it. I would like this, Monty, I'd like to add one other thing. You know, Dan made a you know a point I'd like to to emphasize. You know, we have we have spotters in the air that locate schools of fish. And and of course recreational anglers, you know, like to know where those schools of Manhattan are. Um, so often, you know, in uh, uh, you know, very innocently, they like to find where we're at and come and fish. And that's you know, that's perfectly fine for with us for them to come come near us, you know, if we're there first because we found the fish. But I would hate to have to get to a point where, you know, to keep our boats away from the bridge tunnel, we reciprocate and say, well, if we're in an area first, you know, no no recreational fishermen can come within a mile of us. And because I think that defeats the whole purpose of you know sharing the bay or sharing the fishing grounds. But I think it's that would be very a very similar analogy. Thanks, Dan, and thanks, Monty. Um, I'm looking at the time. We've got a, one more item or a couple more items on the agenda. So I'd like to wrap up discussion on this one. Um, I guess next steps are, well, is there going to be a motion for any kind of formalized consideration or, or if not, then the discussion ends and it's been enjoyable and fruitful and we can move on. Um, so I suppose I would put it to the committee for contemplation of any sort of formalized motion of a, of something that we might ultimately vote on. Um, this is Mike Leonard. I don't know if I would suggest this in a form of a motion, but I, I do think there's a, whether it's somewhere between perception or reality, um, I mean, clearly the conflict's enough that we're talking about it here, but it it, it doesn't seem to me that there's enough um, quantified information uh, really to know one way or another. I, I do agree that the conflict goes both ways. I do think to the point that was made, um, you know, if this, if a commercial fisherman feels harassed, they know to call VMRC immediately. I'm not so sure that a good chunk of recreational fishermen uh, have that same familiarity and awareness. Um, I think to some extent too, recreational fishermen may just based on the size of the vessel feel a little bit more intimidated and feel like, well, maybe I, I do need to get out of the way here. Um, so I do wonder if, and maybe this is something where VSSA, VMRC, you know, American Sport Fishing Association would be happy to help too. If there's um, uh, awareness efforts we need to, to undertake to ensure anglers are um, aware that if conflicts do arise, make sure you've called this number. Um, but, you know, again, it, 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 I wonder if a lot of it goes unreported and to the extent we can help ensure that those conflicts are reported, if that might be an appropriate first step here, um, and again, I'm not sure what form that takes at, at this point in time, but uh, it seems tackling what may be unreported um, conflicts first and seeing, you know, maybe shine a little bit more light on those might be a better way to go forward for now. Mr. Mark, if I could say, I could uh, respond to, to Mike just a second. Um, I was gonna say this until the end, but I'll, I'll say it now. Um, you know, I've mentioned to, to Pat and Shanna and even uh, Rob, you know, that we would uh, we would welcome, you know, this committee or any group of you know recreational anglers to come here to our plant, take a tour, uh, go on one of our boats. And if it's not uh, during fishing season, during Monday through Friday, we'd even have our captains here to uh, have a uh, open dialogue and discuss any of these type issues. So I'll just throw that out there for people to, to think about if that's 
something that, that this group or you know, there have been a number of fishing associations that we have, have brought in here and toured and uh, and talked with. Um, obviously not not yours, but you know, we are we are more than open to that. Great, thanks. Um, sounds like maybe the emergent discussion is for um, increased uh, awareness or just increased. Um, uh, how do you say uh, quantification isn't the right word, but um, recommendations toward thinking about ways to increase awareness, um, which I think is fine. So, last word, Steve, since you brought this up, um, are you satisfied with the d discussion at this point? Do you want to see things in the future? Are there other things that we should be adding to this discussion and, and potentially keep it going next meeting? Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would add, yeah, I, I like the idea of, you know, let's let's bring some awareness to the fact that if people do have a conflict, let's give them someone to call so at least it can get documented. And I think um, part of that is also explaining to people that if you're fishing in a certain spot uh, and you're there first, correct me if I'm wrong, you're entitled to stay there if other boats show up. You don't have to pull your anchor and leave. And I hope people, I'm, I'm sure most people understand that, but I think that kind of goes along with this. So yeah, if we can get some awareness around what to do if there is a conflict, um, I think that's a good, a good first step. And then we also might want to, uh, to Chris's point, examine what other regulations for other gear are already in place. Um, and, and we may find something there that's, that's worth, uh, talking about. Great. Sounds good. Um, Shanna, have, have you captured or someone captured that sentiment for, cause we'll have to flesh this out, especially for the minutes. Yep. We have, um, Olivia's taking minutes. We are covered. Great. Um, not unrelated, Steve, but I guess you had another point you wanted to raise. So um, if you wouldn't mind shifting to, um, I guess, the Virginia Beach uh, idea that you were bringing forward. Yes, and, and, and this is something that uh, Monty probably knows much more about than I do. Um, I simply wanted, th there's been this, this agreement in place for years now, and as I understand it, it, it works. Um, it, it was between um, the purse seine boats and the, some of the charter boat captains at Rudy Inlet. And I have spoken with them and, and they're happy with the agreement. I simply brought it up only to, uh, to put it out there so that people are aware of it. And uh, we, may, we may want to, again, at some point, uh, bring some awareness to this among the larger recreational boating community. The, the charter boat captains know this very well. Um, apparently, many of many recreational anglers don't necessarily know about it. Monty, you want to take a minute or two to kind of give give us a history on this? Yeah, in in 2015, I read an article in the in the pilot. Uh, a bunch of uh, uh, charter boat captains out of Rudy and Let who were concerned about their ability to catch fish when they were trolling. Um, and they thought that some of the reason could be the Omega protein boats in the area. Um, so I reached out, I found a point of contact and one of the, the, the informal leaders of, of those guys. And I reached out to him and asked if I could come down and, and speak to a group of them. And, and he helped arrange it uh, for me. Um, went down uh, about 25 or so of those captains and uh, we talked, I showed them a presentation, explained how we operate, uh, listened to what their concerns were. And you know, the bottom line of it was what I, you know, what I learned was that, that most of these guys were people who went out, you know, way offshore and fished much of the year, but there was a period of the year between Memorial Day and Labor Day that they made most of their money and their business was trolling up and down the uh, the beach area off Virginia Beach. 
Um, and they essentially asked very, you know, very nicely, could we just avoid that area during that period? Um, you know, in case there was some interference that or maybe it's really, I think the issue was the, the engines that uh, they thought would, if we were nearby, scare the fish away. Um, so we made an agreement that, you know, from Memorial Day to Labor Day, from uh, a point three miles offshore of Cape Henry Light down to Sandbridge Pier, you know, we would avoid that area during that period when they were, you know, that when they their business so much depended on uh, that trolling. And we've done that. We haven't had any any issues with it, and uh, you know, it's it's worked well. Um, you know, I I am I would be opposed to making putting this into regulation because fishing you know fishing areas and fishing timelines change over time um you know they may not those guys may not be trolling there two years from now and you know there'd be no reason we couldn't go inside of that three line and catch a, a school of fish if we needed to um you know i guess I, I i don't see an issue here i understand steve's comment about making more people aware of it um which is i mean which is fine uh but uh, you know, I, I guess if if no one's seen us in there, um, you know, in that in those time periods, uh, then I guess it's all working. Um, you know, there are a few you see a few uh, set set plots on the slide that Shanna put up. Um, all those have been outside of that uh, Memorial Day to Labor Day time frame. It's not a lot. This area is very much like the bridge tunnel. We don't loiter in there. Um, you know, we, we go in there, if we see something worthwhile, we catch it and we leave. You know, I, I, I see this as one of those, you know, professional courtesy things that, you know, I would, I would, you know, hate to see codified in a regulation. I mean, you know, there are other, what I call fishing, fishing ground courtesy things like, you know, crabbing, you don't throw your pots in the, in, the, in another crabber's line you know you don't go and somebody's anchored and chum and you don't go and anchor right there behind them in their chum line and uh you know, they're just unwritten unwritten rules and uh and i guess this one seems to be working as well monty did to the best of your knowledge do you you know or can you speculate i mean do you have do you have plans to maintain this moving forward or are there any can you share with us any changes or anything that might yeah, come? No, you know, as long as those guys, you know, continue to to, to need that area to make their living um, during that time frame, we don't. Steve, I liked your comment about awareness. Um, do you have any thoughts on how to increase awareness? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, one thought is simply. Um, sharing the information with the uh, area angler clubs anglers clubs there's a number of them down there as well as the the group that i'm part of so certainly um you know when people have questions about um potential conflicts and issues it's just like you let people know that there is a uh, there is a, a gentleman's agreement and a professional courtesy whatever you want to call it i think that's fine and again if people understand that if there is some sort of conflict or somebody thinks that somebody's not playing fairly, then um, you know, here's here's a number you can call. That sounds good. I think we can work on um fleshing that out, you know, so that that information can be readily distributed. And I guess I was gonna sort of say at the end um to the committee. By all means, um, please go back to your, rep, you know, your, the groups you represent to convey the, the discussion here. As we, you know, as we have meetings, the intent is for you to inform the folks you're representing. So please make sure you're trying to do that to the best of your, your ability. And if any of the written material that we um, discuss is relevant, we can work on supplying that to um, to the broader communities as well. So. Um, any other discussion on the Virginia Beach topic from the committee? Yeah, Rob, this is AJ. I have a question. Okay. Uh, questions for Steve. Um, specifically in the proposal, I think I saw on the attachment that went out to the committee members, it said the verbal agreement between Omega, Omega Protein, and the charter fleet. So I'm, I'm correct in understanding that it, it's not 
specific to the bait industry? Uh, to be honest, I don't know. Uh, I spoke with Steve Richardson, who was one of the original charter captains that was part of this. Uh, he specifically mentioned Omega protein. He did not mention bait, and I did not ask. Hey, this is Monty. That I mean, that's true. I I didn't feel I could speak for, you know, for the other two businesses. Uh, I there I think I think they're both well aware of what you know what Omega does here. Um, but but you're right. The agreement was between uh, Omega and the, the charter guys. Okay, uh, I'm, I was just curious. One sure. clarification. I I mean, it's not that we're opposed to this. I think communication and and awareness okay. is is uh, very important on both sides. So. Um, I, I just want to be clear because I saw the writing that Steve had in the in the proposals. Thank you. Got you. Thanks. Hey, Rob, this is Mike Leonard. I have, I have one more question sort of related to a lot of what we've been talking about recently, but it's more kind of looking forward because I imagine we'll be having several other discussions that involve us looking at those maps with the, um, the set coordinates, but I, I wanted to jump back to the comment about how and, and again, totally sympathize with having to record this off of um, log sheets from the 60s or whenever it was. But um, I, I, I think I picked up on the fact that there's a fair amount of uncertainty in inputting those coordinates. But you know, these are being presented as here's where the sets were. So I don't know, it'd be helpful to know the magnitude of the accuracy of those coordinates. Um, I mean, I'm sure there's rough accuracy to it, but, you know, again, they're sort of presented as here's where we're doing our sets, but then at the same time heard the comment about, well, but sometimes there can be human error involved in there. So I think it might just be helpful to know how far off some of that could be, particularly as we're looking at these fairly uh, detailed areas, such as around Virginia Beach and around the Bay, uh, the Bay Bridge. Yeah, that's a good point, Mike. Thanks. Um, I don't know. I don't know much about this system, so I might not be the best person to comment. But I don't know who QAQCs the data once they leave Monty's shop. Um, I guess that's within NOAA. Shanna, do you know or Pat? Yes, that's all within NOAA. Yeah. And. I assume they just have their own procedures for QAQC, and do we know anything about them? Um, yeah, so like Monty's saying, they there is the scanning and they do end up QAQCing. I don't know the percentage that they QAQC. I could uh, reach out to our contact at NOAA and try to get some information on that if the committee would like to hear more. Mike and, and any others, is that something we should pursue? Um, yeah, I, I guess so. Um, again, I, I don't want to take us down a rabbit hole here. I just, and I, and I appreciate even having some data to look at. It's just, um, again, it'd be helpful to know just how accurate we're talking here, recognizing that there does appear to be um, at least some level of potential for human error work its way in. Um, so maybe we can uh, we can get a, a statement from NOAA just, you know, generalizing their QA or QC procedure and, and see what what they do and how they fix things, I guess, to start there. Yeah, I can definitely reach out and get that. I will say um, in general, this isn't unusual for really any data set. Um, you know, the, the accuracy of a GPS coordinate is going to vary based on, you know, what you're using to collect those coordinates, et cetera. Um, but from the QAQC side, I can definitely get some information from NOAA as to what their exact procedures are um, in reference to these records. Um, I just, I guess I would note that this isn't unique to really any data. Yeah. Very good. Um, last, well, I want to quote, we're, run, we're running out of time here. Um, I want to close the discussion, but any last comments on this before we move to other business and adjourn? Mm, 
hearing none, I'll say thank you to Steve, thank you to Monty and everyone who contributed. Um, this was our first trial run at, the, at this idea of, you know, somebody brings forth a proposal, if somebody needs to respond, then we give them time to respond and then discussion. If there's modifications to this, please, I'm, I'm open to hearing those. Um, if you liked it, then, you know, let us know. We're a new committee, we're still working out the, the ground rules for procedures, so I'm open to hearing suggestions moving forward. Um, other business, what do we have, Shanna? Discussion on future standard meeting time? Yes, that's what we've got for other business. I think we wanted to discuss with the committee if they would appreciate us just setting a specific time in um, both March and November, I believe we agreed on, um, as far as if it should be like the, you know, a second Tuesday of the month set from four to six if this time works for people um, to, to just have something that's kind of standing and set up, but we wanted to get the committee's preference on that. Yeah, so comments on that. Um, I know probably staff would appreciate not having to doodle everyone and chase down common dates. Um, I would generally support it, but um, I want to hear from others if there's any any issues or challenges with that, with that approach. Uh, this is Chris. I, I think that's a great idea. Uh, the longer we can plan out, the better, um, and, and that's really helpful. I, I would reiterate, um, my request from the previous meeting that, you know, I, I think even tonight we've seen that we've we've run over. Um, <clears throat> I think we still have a number of issues to discuss. I think it would be worthwhile to get this group together again um, over the summer and not wait till till October um, to to look at issues that may come forward and and also um, you know d discuss items that may come up during that time period. I agree. Are there specific issues that we need to bring forward for a summer meeting, I guess, would be the question. Uh, at this point, I mean, I, I think we've already talked tonight about, uh, you know, seeing some of the other pieces around the CBBT, uh, the fishery independent data, I think would be another point. Uh, another thing just top of my mind is obviously there was a TC meeting today. And there was some new info uh, about some work that Rob, I, I know you're doing now, uh, and Mike Wilberg. I think an update on that would actually be uh, really helpful uh, during that meeting time as well. So, I, several issues just I, I think we've already discussed tonight or have come up in the last couple of days that um, would be worthwhile discussing. I have a, um, a conference call planned with the chair of the TC, and um, I will clarify. The situation um, that you just referenced, Chris. So um, stay tuned. You'll hear it once the TC is aware. Okay. So I guess a, there's a proposal, Chris. Can I infer that you're proposing um, a summer meeting as at least for this year, or possibly a standing summer meeting? Um, yeah, I, I think, yeah, I think, you know, Pat and I talked about this a little bit, you know, most of the, um, the advisory committees meet, uh, you know, four times a year or less, I think was what Pat and I kind of discussed. I, I think being that we're trying to plan these out, um, let's go ahead and put at least three on the calendar per year. And if, if no agenda items pop up for the summer meeting, then that's completely fine. But, um, I think if, if people have agenda items, uh, you know, admittedly now that we're not meeting together, which it, it's unfortunate in a lot of ways, but the flip side is it's fortunate that we can, we can all be together and it only takes us two minutes to pop on uh, to do these type of meetings. So I, I think we can have a worthwhile discussion. Uh, there'll be another uh, ASMFC meeting between now and then. There may be items that come out of that that we want to discuss as well if a, if a new management document gets started. So I, I think the there's plenty that we we could discuss and setting up a summer meeting makes sense. And then again, if we feel like there's not enough agenda items to to have that meeting, um, obviously we can we can cancel that. So proposal on the floor for a summer meeting, any discussion um, from other members? So from a staff standpoint, um, 
I will say um, we we're fine to have a summer meeting. Um, however, I don't think that it's going to be necessary to always have a meeting following ASMFC meetings. Um, I don't, I, I feel like we're, I don't want to reiterate exactly what happens at every board meeting. That information is definitely readily available. I think if the committee has specific topics that they'd like to outline, like Chris had discussed, a summer meeting is fine. Um, I'm okay with any timing in the summer as well. I don't think we have specific things that are overlapping during that time period. So potentially a June meeting perhaps or July. July would probably be better for staff. We're doing a lot of blue crap stuff in June. July sounds good to me. Okay. Any other comments on the summer meeting idea? Hearing none, um, so we will schedule one for this July. Um, back to the idea of a standard meeting date time, second Thursday of the month, you know, idea at four to six. Um, what's the committee's feeling on, on setting up that kind of structure? Uh, Wednesday afternoons are better. So uh, is it the end is end of the month reasonable? So from a timing standpoint, Shanna, does ASMFC in November meet? They meet earlier in the month, right? Yes, they do. So maybe. Um, Usually October or first week of November. Yeah, yeah. So, like, third Wednesday or last Wednesday of every month, four to six. How does that fly? That should be okay. I'm just scrolling forward through the calendar just to make sure that that doesn't conflict with like holidays and whatnot. Rob, we we don't have any any interstate meetings in July. The first week in August, we have uh, ASMFC. The next week after that's Mid Atlantic. And then the annual meeting is, is the 18th through the 22nd of October. So it shouldn't and interfere with it. Shouldn't interfere with the November meeting. Yeah, I was going to say nothing later November for you guys. I would nope. say let's do November 17th. If you're doing like the 24th, that's uh, we're getting kind of close to Thanksgiving. Yeah, fair enough. Um, And we don't have a commission meeting scheduled for November either, so that's good. So that's third Wednesday. So why don't we shoot for third Wednesday of our meeting months, four to six? Does that seem okay? Yep. Uh, and thank you for consideration of adding that extra meeting. I, I do appreciate it. Okay, so market calendars. We've got the third Wednesday in July, third Wednesday in November. Four to six um, summer meeting will depend on whether there's a enough of, enough material to cover um, to to get us together. If not, we'll be sure to communicate that we'll wait until uh, November. Any last questions, comments, concerns, um, and anything that comes to someone you know later and later on after we adjourn, feel free to email me or Shanna or both of us. Um, happy to get your feedback on things. Okay. Was there a comment? Oh, yeah. No, I was going to thank you all for your time. Sorry we went a few minutes late. Um, I appreciate the, the discussion and the commentary, and uh, I think it was productive. We will work on minutes to get those out to you, and in the minutes, um, we will try to more formally kind of describe the emergent themes of, of awareness that, that were brought forth from uh, the proposals put out by Steve, and and please be sure to re review those to make sure that they reflect um, what you recall from the meeting and, and your intent with those. Um, so with that, I'll close. Um, thanks for your time. I hope everyone has a great uh, spring, and we'll look forward to getting together again in the summer. And then maybe by the end of 21, we can actually do this in person. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks, Thank Rob. You. Thanks, Shanna. Have a good day. Yep. Thanks, everyone.